Good morning, everybody. So I would like to thank the uh, scientific committee for giving the opportunity uh, to conduct an IC in this prestigious All India Ophthalmological Society conference. The topic which we would be taking up today is understanding the dynamics of iris in phacoemulsification surgery. So this would include the phacoemulsification surgery wherein we have all the problems related to iris and the sequelae involved in it, wherein I would be taking up intraoperative floppy iris syndrome and fluid misdirection syndrome. Dr. Amar Agarwal would be taking up iris repair. Answers to small pupil would be taken by none other than Dr. Suvain. And iris prolapse, what next? We have dedicated full 12 minutes to it. What are the etiopathogenesis and everything involved in it? So let's get things going. So I would be talking about intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Well, we should know what are the causes of iris prolapsing. It could be a positive pressure, which Dr. Tushya would be dealing, procedural causes he would be dealing. I would be dealing with iris challenges as far as floppy iris is concerned. That is primarily because of alpha-1 adrenergic blockage but it can be there because of atrophic iris, chronic use of pilocar, and pseudo-exfoliation syndrome. So let's see what happens. Whenever any patient who is getting treated for BPH is using tamsulosin or any other alpha adrenergic receptor blocking agent, specifically more the alpha-1 alpha adrenergic receptors which are in the form of tamsulosin, so it blocks the dilator muscle of iris. So wh what happens when the dilator muscle of iris gets blocked? There is a predisposition to reduce maximum pupillary diameter. Why? Because there is a dilatation of the dilator muscle of iris. And what happens whenever we use it for a long time? There is a prolonged blockage causes disuse atrophy and thinning of the dilator muscles. So what happens is that there's a reduced maximum pupillary, pupillary size. That is the first thing which is there. The second thing is, let's understand what happens to the iris structure. Well, the iris structure gets changed because of blockage, disuse, and the dilator muscle region, as you will find it there, becomes thinned out and atrophic. So what happens when it, uh, whenever there's a fluid uh, influx so whenever there's an excess of fluid to the posterior aspect of the iris, because of the thinned out iris in this half, there is increased billowing. So mark my words, there is going to be increased billowing in response to the fluidics in the anterior chamber. So let's understand the dynamics in iris trauma in normal patients. So what happens is, there's a strong dilated tone, dilated tone so pupil dilated with maximum dilatation, so whenever there is an iris touch, the trauma causes minimum pupillary constriction because of the fact that the dilator muscle is stronger. So whenever there is a repeated touch, as you would find now, it will constrict slightly because the dilator tone is still stronger than the constrictor tone. And whenever there is a repeated, so that there the constrictor muscle overpowers and we have pupillary constriction. So this is what the basic phenomenon is. And how different is it? When, we are, when the patient is using alpha-1 antagonist drug, so there's an exaggerated response to iris touch. So here what you will find is that there is a weak dilator muscle tone action. A, strong t a small touch causes pupillary constriction. So this is the difference. So IFIS has iris billowing, fluttering, progressive pupillary constriction, and tendency of iris to prolapse. As you will see, there is iris billowing, constrictive, uh, progressive pupillary constriction, and iris prolapsing through the incisions. So there's a good incidence of floppy iris or prolapse in patients who are using these drugs. So what are the preoperative challenges and the intraoperative challenges? Let, I'll talk about the preoperative challenges first. It takes a longer dilatation time for the pupil to dilate. It's, you have to mark who the patients who are using tamsulosin, and you have, you have to give them adequate time for the pupil to dilate. 
So what are the pre-operative pharmacomedriasis which we have to under which, which we have to use? Parasympatholytics, because they have an indirect in action by inhibiting iris constrictor muscles in the form of atropine, cyclopentolate, or tropicamide. Sympathomimetics, they act in cohesion with parasympatholytic because they have a direct action by displacing tamsulosin and increasing iris tone. However, it is inefficient when the atrophy of the muscle occurs. It is only more efficient when the blockage is there. It can be used in the form of epinephrine or phenylephrine and non-steroidal have their action as everybody is aware of. So what is the predictive test for risk for intraoperative floppy iris syndrome in patients who are using alpha-1 antagonist drugs? Any pupil who is around 7 or less than 7 is predisposed. So that is something which we need to understand. And what is the use of malignin and the Suvain BHEX ring in uh, you know, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome? Well, no doubt it maintains 6 millimeter pupil. But the most important thing which you have to bear in mind is that there is still IFIS in 93% patients. So no doubt this, no, there is no significant intraoperative or postoperative complication. So what we have to realize that no doubt we can use these uh, you know, intraoperative uh, uh, pupillary expansion devices, but we should know what the technique is. So the this video is a stepwise approach in a blue iris patient on tamsulosin for more than 15 years with maximum pupillary dilatation of 4.2 mm. Preoperatively, the pupil needs to be given adequate time to dilate. A micro incision with a long anterior tunnel parallel to the iris is given. A short tunnel can predispose to iris prolapse. A calibrated sideport incision with a 25 gauge needle is made. This provides additional anterior chamber stability, atraumatic surgery and minimal fluid access to posterior surface of iris. 25 gauge needle creates 500 micron diameter incision. The shaft of the chopper is fashioned between 400 to 450 micron from the distal to the proximal part. This provides adequate sinking in shape and size allowing easy manipulation in interior chamber. The long thin tunneled incision decreases predisposition to iris touch and frequently makes the incision self-sealing. There is no change in pupil size and no excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris thereby minimizing the chances of billowing and progression of IFIS. Non-calibrated sideport incision causes IFIS with disproportionate efflux of fluid, unstable interior chamber, excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris, and iris prolapse. Intracameral epinephrine is used to dilate the pupil. Epinephrine is more effective in early stage when receptors are blocked. However, in this advanced case, due to muscle atrophy, there is less vitreosis. In dilated pupil size less than 4.5 mm, a dilating aid can be easily used. In this case, viscodispersive OVD is injected over the sub-incisional iris followed by injection in the remaining part. Urshnoff's tri soft shell technique for OVDs includes using viscodispersive over the iris, viscocohesive in the pupillary area with PSS below the viscocohesive with use of low parameters. OVD injection has to be guarded as overinflation can cause iris prolapse. Capsulorexis is done with forceps through micro incision. The plane of the forceps is kept close to the capsule for control. Cystitome also helps with enhanced chamber stability. Slow hydrodissection is done as vigorous hydrodissection can cause iris prolapse. Low fluid parameters are used. Low IOP nuclear emulsification is carried out to provide stable chamber settings. 
continuous irrigation is not used, the irrigation is stopped and then the tip taken out. Keeping irrigation on while removal of tips predisposes to iris prolapse and IFI. Nuclear chopping of grade 2 to 3 nuclear sclerosis is done using selective use of vacuum at deeper plane to allow firm gripping of nucleus. The aim is to chop into small nuclear fragments with total separation. The separated nuclear fragments are left in C2 till we achieve totally separated nuclear fragments. This helps in providing stable interior chamber and capsular bag and decreased excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris. Firmly gripped hard nuclear fragments are brought at the level of interior capsule. Nuclear emulsification of the hard fragments require higher fluidics. The emulsification is done in the center and in the proximal half of the pupil to avoid inadvertent emulsification of iris. The central position helps in avoiding aspiration of viscodispersive OVD used in this case. Irrigation and aspiration is done using a curved coaxial tip with sleeve highly retracted to separate the plane of irrigation and aspiration. The vacuum is not increased below the iris to avoid inadvertent trauma to the iris. The vacuum is increased after fixing the cortex and bringing it in the center and the tip is not angled downwards. Bimanual irrigation and aspiration can be the preferred technique depending on the surgeon's choice. The separation of plane of irrigation and aspiration helps in stabilizing the interior chamber and preventing excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris. So decoding, we should know the technique. It has to be an atraumatic surgery. Use sympathomimetics to your advantage. That's a very important part which we have to realize using intracameral adrenaline, epinephrine as and when required, viscomidriasis, decrease excess of fluid to posterior iris aspect, Calibrated side port incision. Well, side port incision is like an, uh, what should I say, an adopted child. We are not looking after that. So that has to be looked after because calibrated side port incision, if we don't take care, that causes the flux of fluid and that precipitates IFIS. So low IOP FACO is also very important. Summarizing, no predisposition in patients using alpha antagonist drugs. Your whole staff should be aware of that. Use pupillary dilating aids to your advantage. Most importantly, know the techniques. Thank you very much. So next would be uh, Dr. Uh, Amar Agarwal, who would be taking up iris repair. In the meantime, you know, uh, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome is something side port incision and your side port chopper. There should not be a disagreement between them. Because if there is a disagreement, because, you know, I personally feel that if you have to, ha you, sh you have to respect tissues to get the required results. I would suggest that everybody who does surgery should see what the pupil size is when the surgery starts and when the surgery ends. And if by any means you find that the pupil size has decreased, you have to know the reason. This means you have touched the iris and created problems. Yeah, Docs, sir, you are ready? I'm ready. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Rohit and Tushya for this course. Rohit is perhaps, I would say, one of the leading persons, not only as an eye practitioner in 
Amritsar, but I think in India he must be one of the largest single practice people in the country. That shows huge numbers which he is doing. And second thing about Rohit is every year, T Rohit and Tushya, they win every year the top coveted film festival awards in the, either the ASCRS, ESCRS and Academy. And this year he has courses even in the American Academy, which is very, very prestigious. So coming back to this topic on the iris, what I thought was I'll show some couple of videos for you. One of the issues which you have is today, a lot of patients have previously been operated with radial keratotomy. Now all these patients are coming back with cataract and that's one problem which you're facing. The problem with these RK or AK or any of these cases is this. You do the surgery, whatever your IOL power calculation comes, there will be a mess somewhere. Second thing is it changes. So effectively you have to tell the patient for three months I cannot predict how much power you will have. These are actual realistic problem which you face. So now you see this patient has got RK, AK and 10 diopters of astigmatism because these are not controllable to be honest to you. Vision is 660, slight cataract is present so we decided we have to anyway remove the cataract in these cases. Try to make your incision between those two RK cuts and if you notice that's what I try to do but invariably sometimes one of those opens also still. So you should be very practical and real that these things can happen. Anyway, coming back to the story of the RK AK case, you can see I've done the phaco emulsification and that should be easy for any one of you here. Once that's done, you can put in a lens of your choice. If you want your toric IOL, you can put it in. But be understand one fact. There is no toric IOL to correct this sort of high astigmatism. The second problem is even if you correct it, you are not sure what the post-operative refraction is going to be because as I said, the power keeps on changing because of the RK incisions. So here, once you have implanted the IUL, the question comes now, what do we do to see that the patient is happy at the end of the day? So the answer is very simple. What we are going to try to do here is simple. We want to make that iris into a pinhole. Here you can see I want fluid in the eye, so I'm fixing a trocar AC maintainer. You can see this is the device that we have designed. It goes through the sclera, but goes about half millimeter from sclera only. It's not three millimeters like in the retina cases. If you want, you can do this with viscoelastic also. But either way, now you see I'm passing the needle straight through clear cornea from one side. From the other side, a paracentesis, take a 30 gauge needle railroad the two. Once you have done that, now you see I bring that loop out through the paracentesis. That is a single pass. Now remember, pass it through that loop four times. So that is single pass, four throw, pupiloplasty. Once I have done it four times, you see all I have to do is pull and cut with a micro scissor and that's done. Normally you tend to do three to two or whatever you want to do, but this is just once, four times. So it's very simple. You can do as much as you want. You see, I made it smaller. But if I want to make a pinhole, I need to make it 1.5. So here I'm making it smaller. I need to do more of the single pass, four throw, pupiloplasties. What is the basic aim? Principle is very simple. I want to make my pupil that small so that my peripheral rays are blocked. It goes through my central one millimeter pupil and you can see that's the pinhole marker you can have. More single pass being done because it's still large enough. The second important issue is you got to notice is my Purkinje image. Now invariably sometime when you do this, it'll become too small. If it becomes too small, I have fluid in the eye. I use my vitrectomy probe and I will just enlarge it a little bit and center it. So you see that? I have centered it. Now the game is simple. Look at that P1. This is the triangle as you're seeing is the Purkinje image P1. That has to be centered onto the pupil. That's a very important fact. Second thing is what now I've subsequently done is we have designed a pupillary device with Jack Holiday. It's called the Holiday Pupil Device. So you put it in front of the patient and Rohit, if you have 
don't have it, let me know. I'll get one sent for you also. You can get it in the Epsilon stall. Put it in front of the patient and ask him to rotate. So he's got 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, 2 millimeter, whatever it is. Ask him which pupil he likes. Suppose he likes 1 millimeter pupil. I will make my pupil 1 millimeter. Okay, previously I used to make all 1.5. You'll get very good res results. But I want to take that game to the next level. That means I want to gain that one extra line. If I want to gain that extra line, I am now fine-tuning the pinhole. Okay. In this case, I have not done it because I am sticking to a simple principle of sticking to 1.5 as you can see here. Once my Perkins image P1 is centered, I know I am on track here. So I should not be comfortable here. Now I am just suturing up the incisions which are there. Some of them have opened up as you can see. So even if they are there, I will oh, uh, suture those up. Close it up the case now as you can see here. Use some fibrin glue for that area where I opened the trocar AC maintainer being fixed. The question comes now, these patients do extremely well. Actually, if I do them in the morning and I see them next day or in the evening, immediately they'll be about 6, 9 or 6, 12 or something like that. So the results are bang on. The second big advantage in these are they have extended depth of focus. That means they see distance and near without glasses. So let's give an example. You have a patient who had 15 years back LASIK done. You have got cataract. Invariably, you'll make a mistake. Those patients are going to be unhappy. You put a multifocal toric or whatever you want, they'll be unhappy. In my course, later on in the evening, if you are interested, I'll be talking on that also. Very simple in this case, just do a pinhole pupillosity. Next day, the patient is 6'6", N6, without glasses, and they'll be extremely happy. Now, let's take another example, what I thought was to show you. Now, you see this another case here patient had iododialysis injury case with astigmatism so the patient has got high astigmatism also so now i've got two problems one is i've got to treat the iododialysis the second is i have to solve his high astigmatism so now in this case i can say i'll first finish off the phaco emulsification as this is simple procedure for you all. But once you fix my your, your IOL inside, the question comes, how do you treat the aerodialysis portion? So basically, when you have iris repair, there are two main areas you'll face. One, how do I make my pupil smaller? I showed you the path, single pass, fourth throw, pupil plasty. The second is aerodialysis. Okay, now this is aerodialysis, how do you handle it? Very simple way, and I'll show it to you just now. What we designed is a new device called the trocar assisted aerodialysis technique. Actually, Michael Snyder had started the hangback technique. We have modified that and made it slightly better. See, I'm making a scleral groove, just a groove there. Okay, take about one millimeter from the limbus in the area of the aerodialysis. Now, right opposite it, you can see I'm fixing my same trocar AC maintainer. You can see I've just fixed it there. Now, take a double armed proline suture. It's available with anyone there, 90 are available there. Pass it inside through the trocar. Once you have done that, from the other side, you see I've passed a 30 gauge needle. It goes through scleral groove, then through the iris. Now from the other side, you're passing my proline needle. See the advantage of the trocar is if you pass this without the trocar, the problem as Michael Snyder suggested, it gets stuck sometime in the corneal tissue. Then you have to break it and resuture. The second thing is that needle moves. The trocar gives the guidance. So now you see it's so simple. I passed it there. And once I showed Rohit and Tusha this thing, they have taken this game to the next level. And they are using that even for suturing. I think your Sioni rings and all, you can use the same trocar assisted technique. Now once my first needle is out, now I'm going same 30 gauge needle from the other side. Now take, this is a double armed. Okay, so my second arm of the proline needle. Any doubts everyone has, you can ask me. You see, I'm passing it through. Now I'll bring it through the railroad technique. Now all I have to do is pull these two. Once I pull, you can see now, all I'm doing is pulling it. Once I have pulled it, that's over. Now I suture it and bury it into the groove. Very simple technique. Remember, whenever you do aerodialysis, what people make one mistake is, my iris will be pulled off. 
tangent. They leave it like this. Don't leave it like this. Now what you have to do is, now do the single pass. Because now you're doing a two-fold technique. You're combining the trocar-assisted aerodialysis with the single pass fourth row pupillastity. This is called the two-fold technique. All what I'm talking has been published in peer review, JCRs, you can check it out. Or in the European Journal or anyone has doubts, you can email me also. But now, I pull out the trocar because I don't need it now anymore. Okay? Now I'll do the single pass fourth row pupillastity. I've already told you about it. Now, if you don't have astigmatism, all you do is to make the pupil smaller. You can make it four millimeters, whatever you want. But make that pupil round. Because right now, if you notice, my iris is pulled upwards on the side of the aerodialysis. That needs to be solved. So those who are doing aerodialysis repair without doing the two-fold technique, invariably, post-operatively, you will have patients with glare. Okay? You have to accept that fact. So that's why I tell people to do it. Now you see, I've done this like this. Simple. That's over. Now once that is cut, now you can see I can do more of it. Here you can see now, as much as you want. It's very simple technique. What does it cost you? One suture. Okay? That's all. Now, in this case, there is astigmatism high. So I'm going to make it a pinhole. That means I have to make it slightly smaller. That means I'm going to go for 1.5 millimeters. And you can see that's what I'm trying to do here. Second step is, I told you before, my next step is I got to make my Perkins image P1 bang on the pupil. Look at where it is. It's on the iris. It's not on the pupil. This will happen. Please be real. So always keep a vitrectomy machine next to you. You need it. Every FACO machine of yours has a vitrectomy machine. Any FACO machine you take will have a basic vitrectomy machine. That's enough for you. You don't need a, uh, a posterior vitrectomy machine. I use a posterior vitrectomy machine because it's available, but you don't need it. So now you see the Purkinje images on the iris, not on the pupil. Look at that. Okay, I know this patient is not going to be happy. So now I use my Trocar AC maintainer fixed for fluid. I'm doing my pupillectomy there with the vitrectomy probe, and you can see there gradually i'll just make it slow keep it on low cutter so that even if you press your foot pedal down bang on it will still not cut too much once you have done this you can also use an endocautery if you want to flatten it a bit more but here you can see i'm just chewing it up a bit more making the p1 perkins image bang centered now you see my per perkins image is bang centered onto the pupil once that's done i know i'm on track Look at the endometer I'm using to get me a better visual effect. Okay, but it's not needed. Since I have it already in my machine, I use it for a better video effect. That's all, to be honest to you, so that you people will see better. But those who don't have it, don't need it. So this basically sums up my presentations basically here. Here you can see I'm just sealing up the thing. This is the show the aerodialysis with 12 after elastic button. I've done the FACO, done the trocar assisted aerodialysis, done the single pass for through so that's a two-fold technique. And you end, you have landed up with a pinhole pupillastity. So this is how the preoperative on-table patient is. One month post-op, patient was 6'6", six, six, N6, six, without glasses. You can see the pre-op, one month post-op. I'd like to thank Rohit and Tushya for allowing me for this presentation. Thank you very much, Rohit. It's a very good question. Uh, what are the indications for pinhole? As time is going by, my indications, to be honest to you, are increasing. We just started it for high astigmatism. I give you an example, and those of you are free, please check. I think it's in Hall D. I have a course at four o'clock. I'll be talking on it. But I had a patient, uh, Rohit, with post dalk. Okay, so I thought patient had four diopters of astigmatism. So I said, listen, yeah, if I do it, people will say this fellow is honestly doing pinhole pupillastity. So I said, chodo. I won't do pinhole pupillastity. Patient was unhappy, 660 vision. So I was scratching my head and thinking, hello, I put a toric eye in a patient, four out of the why is this man unhappy? Okay, so I contacted Jack Holliday again, and I said, hello, because I knew my optics when I started on pinhole pupillastity, I'm telling you, it's underground. I, I don't even know the spelling of optics, to be honest to you. So I knew when I was starting pinhole pupillastity, I had to take the game to next level, I needed somebody who's a master in this game. So I contacted Jack Holliday long back, and asked him, I need your help to understand this game better. Simple thing, if you go to the holiday pentacam report, and I'll, I can't show it to you now because of my thing, but I'll show it in my course there. There's a thing called RMS value. 
The normal is 0.3. In that patient, it's about 3. So whenever you have a patient, check your RMS value through holiday Pentacam reports. You'll be shocked. So many patients are 1 point something. That's about 0.3 is normal, 1.3. Imagine I did pinol fibrosis, the patient is bang on track. Second indication, pellucid marginal degenerations. Keratoconus. I had a patient with third nerve palsy. Okay, I've got a patient with Aedes pupil also. Okay, I have not done it yet, but I have a patient waiting for me to do on Aedes pupil. So as I can tell you, the number of indications are there. I had a patient whom I'm operating with a corneal injury. I'm doing, let's say, scarred injury here, glued aisle carro. You know, I know that scar is there in the cornea. This fellow is going to have astigmatism. I don't want to do a PK because it's on the side. I do it on table, penal pupillacy, my astigmatism, I know is gone, bang on track. So these are the indications. Good question. Yes! That's the doubt. So what we did was we published this in October 2017, if you see in the JCRS journal. If you take single pass fourth row pupillacy, we published a paper on can we dilate or not. So the fourth row pupillacy, you can dilate. I'm not saying a three millimeter pupil will become 10, but enough for you to see the fundus. But when you talk of pinhole, you're talking of 1.5. So not dilate too much, but central fundus can be seen. If you want the pelvic fundus to be seen, you need optos. But that is a con of pinhole pupillacy. So let's be real. Any technique will have pros and cons. So that is one flip side. Let's theoretically give an example. I've done a pinhole pupillacy in a case. He gets an RD five years later. Theoretic, I'm just saying, let's have it. Nothing here, take a YAG laser, shoot. Game over, you're bang to square one, open it. I'm just giving it as an example. Thank you. What happened was, I got it done in America by Mastel company. The problem what has happened is Mastel passed away. He developed cancer and he passed away recently, you know? You don't know him? Oh, don't say these things. Anyway, whatever it is, he had some problems, but it doesn't matter. So either way, so I got stuck there. I'm talking to a company like BNL in, in uh, ASCR I spoke, but I'm getting stuck there, to be honest to you. Those who don't have, I give you a simple procedure out. Take the Alcon or the BNL trocars. The problem with these are they are long, okay? But use them, okay? But just be careful because they're longer and not designed actually for being a trocar AC maintainer. But I tell you what, they are fantastic. When you use to trocar ACM, you'll shift to trocar ACM rather than do, do the either an AC maintainer or a pass through nut trocars. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rohit, Dr. Tushya. Yeah, uh, thank you for this kind invitation and having me in this wonderful course. Uh, so I'm going to, going to talk about understanding the dynamics of small people. I think it's an all about anticipation, identification, and management. I do have a financial interest in the BX people expander. I'll come to that also. <laughs> so now, the pro what is the problem with small people? When the pupil size comes down to half, the viewing area for the surgeon is reduced to a quarter. This is elementary geometry, and if the surgeon can't see the cataract, he can't operate safely, and that would be a disaster. So, a simple question that I asked now, it's, unfo it's very, uh, you know, kind of uh, paradoxical, let's say. Dr. Rohit is a very skilled surgeon, and he practically uses no devices. Okay, so he's, uh, but in the same course, we speak about devices. So there is a relevance. So what I would like you to do is ask yourself, we've all burnt our fingers, doing surgery without a device and at some point or the other or taking a call a bit too late. So if you were the patient on the table and your eye is being operated and you have a four millimeter pupil, and you got an excellent surgeon operating, what would you prefer? The surgeon use only his skills or take the help of a device? I think you should have your answer. So can the pre-op pupil be a predictor of IFIS? The answer is a big no. For uh, people seven millimeter or smaller, the risk of IFIS existed regardless of alpha blocker intake. And that is the list of conditions which can cause IFIS. It is not tamsulosin alone, unfortunately. Uh, it's a whole lot of drugs over there. And hypertension, there is a large Indian study which said that hypertension was a very risk, big risk factor and every patient, alternate patient is a hypertensive, including the surgeon. So. Uh, 
So no amount of history taking can prevent surprises. Interrupt myosis is unpredictable, and let's come to terms with that. Fortunately, surgeons are reducing the threshold slowly. They have a backup devices in the theater because of the unpredictability of IFIS and exacting patient expectations. Patient, patient expectations have gone through the roof. And unforgiving nature of premium IOLs. You've planned a multifocal, you've planned a toric, you can't have a small people on the table. It's, it's a risk, unwanted risk that you're taking. So I believe a disciplined approach is very important. Treat every eye as a potential IFIS candidate and then start your surgery. So you keep a stock of devices. You don't have to resort to it all the time, but at least the fact that it's, you have it in a theater, it makes a difference to your confidence level. Use in uh, viscoelastics judiciously. But what is, I think, key to understanding small people is distinguishing the elastic small people from the non-elastic rigid small people. That's something we didn't know about, I think, too much. Uh, Curtsy, my device and my work over there, I realized over a period of time that there are two different animals completely. So, and how big do you want to, the pupil to be? Be realistic. We really need a huge pupil. And the choice of pupil device actually very much depends, I mean, whether you want to use an OVD, iris hooks, or pupil expander, the elasticity of the pupil, and how you want to tear the rigid pupil. IFIS, I'm going to tell you that no device actually works for the problems that we have. So injecting viscoelastic, we have a common tendency, as soon as we made a paracentesis, inject a lot of viscoelastic, and let's see how big the pupil dilates. Well, that's the la uh, last thing you should be doing. Uh, because the moment you inject a lot of viscoelastic, you're plastering the iris to the anterior lens surface and you're not leaving any space for the device. And that's going to, the AC becomes deep, ergonomically it becomes difficult. So the, that, play, that is the place you need to inject viscoelastic under the pupil margin and keep the anterior chamber shallow so that you can lift off the pupil margin from the iris, uh, from the lens surface. So keep the AC underfilled. Overfilling is counterproductive. Inject viscoelastic under the pupil margin to create space for the device, whatever you use. So Chang and Campbell in 2005 told us that unlike the non-elastic myotic pupils, the IFIS pupil immediately snaps back to its original size following attempts to stretch it. So small pupils are basically of two types. You can classify them any which way. It's elastic or non-elastic. Elastic pupil is like a rubber band. You can stretch it. Any device will work. Now the rigid or the non-elastic ones are very much like a string. It's not going to stretch. You need to tear it. So how you wish to tear it is up to you, whether you want to use a bulky pupil expander like the Mulligan or the eye ring, or you use Kuglen hooks and then use a delicate device like the BX. That's your choice entirely. We can assess the nature of the pupil before we start. As soon as we made the paracentesis, inject BSS or, uh, or ring lactate, whatever you want, and inflate the anterior chamber. Inject BSS to inflate the anterior chamber. You get a momentary expansion. You know it's an elastic pupil. And if it does not, well, that's, it will not budge. And if, then you know it's a rigid pupil. It's a string. So you need to tear it. So now you take your call how you want to tear it. You don't need to go limbus to limbus tearing it. You need to just tear it for about five millimeters. So you get a good cosmetic, good pupil. Post-op, you still have a round pupil. The patient does not have too much of glare. You don't have to be really you know, too forceful about it. So mechanical dilatation of pupil has no role in IFIS. If it's an elastic pupil, you just, it's going to be counterproductive. If it's a rigid fibrotic pupil, of course it has. So now how we want to dilate? Iris retractors, hooks, or pupil rings like the Malugan ring or the BHEX. So I'll just talk about iris hooks briefly. Uh, this should start. Yeah, so uh, this is side ports first. I, uh, I mean, this is a very old video. I've not used iris hooks in a very long time. Uh, but then that's how, that's the basic principles remain the same. I prefer to keep a conjunctival mark because it becomes very embarrassing sometimes, otherwise you can't find the paracentesis because you're making smaller paracentesis. If it's clear cornea, you just can't find it and then keep struggling. Uh, I would like to keep that retractor, uh, the stopper, push back a lot. Otherwise, again, it's embarrassing. You put the iris hook inside, then you realize okay, now you have to pull back that uh, stopper. I prefer to make my incisions after I made uh, place all the hooks. And I would like to get a handle on the capsule excess size. We tend to get carried away and make a larger excess. Stick to your plan about the excess size. This is an over-retracted pupil. This is an over-retracted. This was the time when we used to have large ones, you know. And remember that the pupil is at the limbal plane. It's elevated to the an anteriorly to the limbal plane, so your space in the antechamber is reduced. Every instrument that you pass is going to knock that iris or the pupil margin, and the pupil margin is often going to be anti-flexed. So remember that. Removal isn't such a big deal. You can use any which we Just hold that stopper, advance that, uh, the hook, and just pull it out. It's very simple. Uh, or you can twist it, turn it however you want. There is a little downside of the iris hooks for the reason, that's the reason why people are moving to pupil expanders. So uh, you may count, count them as downsides or not, depending on your choice. So there is a, uh, definitely a theoretical risk of infection with more incisions. Iris sphincter tear is a, a reality. 
And you are rendering the pupil a square, which is absolutely a waste of space. You are going to work within the capsular axis, and the corners are absolutely wasted. So your anterior chamber is shortened because of the pupil, uh, the irises to an anterior plane, and there is a chance of iris trauma and corneal endothelial damage. This is a study in two published in 2019 where it showed that uh, the time taken with iris hooks was much longer compared to a pupil device, expansion device. It's 14 minutes more for consultants and 24 minutes more for trainees. And of course, if you have a permanent dilated pupil, the pupil patient is never going to forgive you. With a multifocal aisle, you can ask, be looking forward to a lot of trouble. And the cosmetic issues, of course. You don't like to see your post-op eyes on, like this on the slit lamp. So the BHEX is a very thin device, a flexible thin notches, strong flanges, and tabs for holding. It's a hexagonal device. It's thinner than the human, it's as thin as the human hair. So it's a simple design, no rocket science, user-friendly, safe, and I believe affordable also. Uh, so you need, uh, so it's a tra got a transparent housing and uh, you have constant visibility of the device in its entire travel, which you don't have with an injector. In the, when using an injector, you have no clue what the, uh, the ring is doing inside with this twisting, turning, somersaulting, you have no clue till it comes out. You need a BHEX forceps to manipulate it and take it into the anterior chamber. Well, it's, uh, the, I mean, a forceps is very easy for all of us to use and this is an ergonomically devi uh, designed device. Now the inventive step or the difference between the Mulligan ring, I ring, and the BHEX is that the, all these devices were biplanar devices where there were, the, the scroll is like this and the pupil margin is over here. So it's a lot thicker over here and if you want to push this through a slit incision, it is going to snag that incision and get stuck. And on the way out, it's the reverse, it's going to get stuck. So that's why the injector is there to circumvent that problem, not to make your injection or placement of the device safer. So the BHEX is very simple, it's uh, intuitive, so it's an all in a single plane. The iris bends at the notches, the iris bends. The iris can be bent harmlessly, no big deal about that. So you can take that device into the anterior chamber and bring it out with the forceps. How big do you want the pupil to be? Now if I were to tell you that this pupil is not going to come down less than 5.5 mm to do what you made during the surgery, I think most of us in this room are very comfortable operating. 5.5 is a very good size for all of us. We do a 5 millimeter capsule access, finish off the surgery, if you're assured, and that's all you need. So why do you need a 7 millimeter pupil? Even for the hardest cataract, a 5.5 millimeter pupil is good. A larger pupil is actually not very useful. It's only psychological for you. Oh, hard cataract, I need a large pupil. It's just in your mind. So, and even with iris hooks, I think you should stick to a 5.5 size. So let's take a look at this uh, video by Deepak Meghur. It's a pretty hard cataract, rigid pupil, stretches it a little bit, and that's the size of the pupil after the BHEX. It's just 5.5, and this is a pretty hard cataract, as you will see. There's no doubt this is a hard cataract. All you need to do is chop it into smaller fragments. And that's all, and you can deal with as hard a cataract as you want. Your working space is that, that that's, that's all you need. That's your active working space, so the rest of your surgery is easy. Now, IFIS is something which I want to talk about. We all have at one point or time come to believe that, okay, iris looks good, looks good for IFIS or pupil expander, X pupil expander, or y, one more minute for me, is it? Yeah. So, yeah. So, is my best device, is my go to device. All of us have that in our mind, you know, over the period, because it worked well in one particular IFIS case. Try to go back and think. Now, if you analyze a little more objectively, IFS, for me, there are two components, meiosis and iris prolapse. Leave the fluttering. Meiosis part, whether you use iris hooks or pupil expanders, all that they do is provide you constant pupil size, good visibility, safe fit. That's given. Okay, that's, there's no doubt about that. Okay, now if you come to iris prolapse, then you go back and think. No device works, actually. Iris prolapse is a function of severity of IFIS. So that day, that eye, what was in your nasib is what matters. And actually, whether the patient was on tamsulin, so one week or five years really doesn't matter. Even one week can do as bad as uh, five years or worse sometimes. So it's your day, that day, what was your luck, okay? And how you played with the fluidics that day is all. So remember, all you need, get that out of your mind. Iris is prolapsing, let it prolapse. You can see your surgical area, that's what matters. Iris will be a little bit traumatized. I could show you, I think it's a hidden slide, if I can just escape. I'll show you, if, I, if we have a lot of time, do we have a lot of time? Uh, three minutes. <laughs> three minutes more, okay, so, okay, yeah. So I had hidden this slide because, so. So that's this, this is Iris Hooks. 
Look at my iris. I have not finished my capsular excess, and it's a fishing net. Horrible iris prolapse. I'm not a bad surgeon. So this is what. I can't put my phaco probe in. Look at that iris prolapse popping out from the side port. It's iris hooks. But I have safe visibility. I have enough visibility to do my surgery safely. Yes, now you need to deal with that iris prolapse. Every time you put in a device, put in your uh, the phaco probe or the IOL, you need to protect that iris, which is sub from coming prolapsing at the incision with a side port instrument. Take it in, draw it in. Now I'll show you iris prolapse with the BX. That was iris prolapse with the hooks, right? So I'm not claiming that the BX is great. Look at what I'm having. Look. What, look at it logically, what has the device got to do with iris prolapse? The part of the iris which is prolapsing has got nothing to do, you're not done, no, doing anything with your device over there. So it's the flop, how floppy and how sail-like that device, how patchulous that iris is, is going, it's going to prolapse. So between two hooks, what is your, the nature of your iris, is it's going to prolapse. So it's up to you. Mm, so well, as long as you have constant visibility, constant, consider, uh, I mean concentrate on the surgery and I think that works well. So we were there. So. Yeah, so no credit to people device when you don't have iris prolapse, it's just lower grade IFIS that day for you. So if you're having an IFIS case, what you need to do is use a device which goes in through a small incision and comes out through it. So iris hooks are great, and the BX probably would, it, would be there. So it depends upon your choice. I'm not advocating either. No other device, no other people expansion ring can come, in, come out through a one millimeter incision, side port. So that is a huge plus for the BX. If you're using any other device, you will be struggling to take it out. This, in a tight situation, would be a blessing. So intraop myosis, again, I would think you need a device which gives you visibility and assures you that you can, you're not ca holding the capsular excess margin. Right? So uh, with a malignant ring or an eye ring, the part which engages the pupil margin is on the sides. With the top, you just can't see what's happening over there. So you can accidentally hold the capsular excess margin. With a B-hex, what you're doing is you're holding those flanges and tucking them under the pupil margin, and the notches are visible. So you, and you're pushing, as you push that pupil margin, you have instant confirmation that your, the capsular excess margin has not been engaged. And if you do engage, you just retract a bit and come back again. It's very simple. This is a wonderful video uh, available at the American Academy website and by Dr. Tom, uh, uh, Michael Henry. And this is a, with a tube shunt, antechamber shallow, neonevascular glaucoma, uh, it's a difficult case, very shallow anterior chamber. Single incision, the entire BX was in place and the pupil was dilated. We did a good surgery. Look at going it around the tube shunt. You can't do that with any other device. You, you can't do that with any other. You have, see, the diff advantage is with the forceps, you have control at the site of action. With the injector, your control is much more remote. So you can do whatever you want with the flange. And forceps is so easy for us. We are used to using those micro forceps, I mean, for donkey's ears. It's intuitive for us. Of course, taking out the BX is probably the child's game. Yeah, finished, finished, yeah. So choice of pupil expander in intraop myosis is B, uh, BHEX or iris hooks. Very safe. Subluxate cataract, no two uh, second opinion. It's absolutely uh, iris hooks and iris hooks because it allows you kind of asymmetric <laughs> pupil expansion, and I would like to see my subluxated area better than the other areas. So there is no doubt I would use iris hooks and probably use three, uh, every clock hour hook in a subluxated area. I would uh, strongly recommend that you go up and look up this particular uh, uh, PDF, which is available with video, uh, with video links. It's available on a website, free to download, and the 10 tips on fake emulsification. This is also available uh, free to download. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. Thank you, Toshio. <laughs>
You know, uh, one important thing which Dr. Suwain said was, the size of the pupil, 5.5 is more than sufficient. Welcome. So when you are dilating using the iris hooks, don't dilate it more than 5 or 5.5. Because that will cause, the, uh, you know, the advantage would be that will cause less distortion of pupil in the post-operative period. So don't dilate it to more than 5.5. So, I, I, in the initial stages, I used to dilate it more. Exactly. And when we dilate 5.5, we realize that the pupil remains almost the same. Am I right? Dr. Absolutely, Dr. absolutely. Over to you, Dr. Uh, Krishya. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. I would be talking about iris prolapse. What next? So, the different causes of iris prolapse are like positive pressure, which can be due to exogenous causes like uh, increased pressure due to lid speculum, tight drapes, orbital or lid causes, retrobulbar hemorrhage, thyroid, and then there are a few endogenous causes like nanophthalmus, fluid misdirection syndrome, which will be dealt by Dr. Rohit later on, suprachoroidal hemorrhage or effusion. Then you have iris pre disposition like IFIS, which has already been covered by Dr. Rohit, and small pupil. I'll be talking about the procedural causes leading to iris prolapse which depend on these four main reasons, that is floppy iris, as we know can be due to IFIS, atrophic irises, in pseudo exfoliations, chronic use of pilocarpine, and then wound gaping, rapid outflow, and high AC pressure, which I'll be telling you in detail in the next few slides. Why is iris prolapse a problem? As you can see all these pictures, it can cause mitriasis, iris defects, then iris incarceration, then you have uh, edge glare, then you have iris extortions. So all these things are leading to a problem. Why does iris damage occur after a prolapse? That is mainly due to traumatic iris repositioning, which causes loss of iris pigments and defects. So these four things are really important, which lead to the cause of iris prolapse. One is the floppy iris, wound gape, rapid outflow of the visco or fluid and high pressure in the interior chamber. When does wound gape occur? When you have an instrument which is smaller than the wound, like hydro dissection cannula while doing hydro dissection, there is a rapid outflow due to the wound gape. Then people who are doing capsul uh, capsular exercise uh, with the forceps from the main port, if you are uh, pressing on the floor of the wound, then tapered tip of irrigation sleeve, FACO or IA, or when the wound is too large in comparison to your instruments. And when does rapid outflow occur? For example, when during hydro dissection, immediately after the fluid wave is created, irrigating while entering or exiting the main wood of the instruments, when you are putting your irrigation on when, with the FACO probe in or out, then flow around an instrument when the wound is too large, or when there is an overinflation of AC with OVD. High pressure in AC also leads to iris prolapse. So our main aim is to create negative pressure in the interior chamber. And another thing which we have to keep in mind is that we use, we should use maximum no touch repositioning, which I'll show you different techniques, which would avoid iris damage. Like hydro dissection, if there is a uh, high pressure in the AC, just decompress the fluid wave behind the lens with the spatula from the paracentesis side port. Release the aqueous or visco from the paracentesis by depressing the side port incision. 
release iris from the incision and try to deepen with the deepen the anterior chamber with the subincisional injection of viscoelastic avoiding overinflation or just gentle tapping on the main wound incision site which i'll be showing you the videos later on so coming to the risk steps risk steps in cataract surgery for iris prolapse first is the short tunnel then lifting or depressing the roof or floor of the tunnel with the instrument hydro dissection which causes wound gape caused by the cannula fluid wave prolapses can cataract anteriorly causing a rapid outflow of the ovd of course the floppy iris goes with the flow irrigating while entering or exiting the main incision wounds which are too large and stromal hydration so whenever you have short tunnel and if you diagnose it early what you have to do is you have to think of the each step ahead as always you should remember that iris has got memory so first of all exogenous causes like lit speculum if there is any uh, tight lit speculum or drape you should lighten the uh, posterior vitreous pressure then secondly if you diagnose it early uh, we, what we can do is we can just abandon the short wound and make another incision some people do use iris hook wind directly under the wound then when uh, when you're going to start hydro dissection what you can do is you can remove the excess ovd prior doing the hydro dissection and make sure that you tap the lens to release the excess fluid then through and if you have a iris prolapse which is seen in short tunnel what you can do is you can go through the paracentesis gently push the prolapsed iris near the wound with the spatula from the side port incision and uh, of course remember whenever you are using when you whenever you are entering your phaco proof irrigation should always be off in entering and exiting the wound then of course by manual ia has a preferred uh, thing so this is i'm just going to show you a few videos so if you see here what i've done here is i'm these are my uh, learning videos in the initial stage so i've made an uh, short tunnel so if you see here what is happening here is you can see a iris prolapse so what is the reason of iris prolapse here so when i'm first of all short tunnel second thing is what when i uh, inserted my your tata forceps through the main wound what has happened is i was depressing the forceps on the floor of the wound so what happened is as we remember those four things so there is a rapid outflow of the visco from the main wound which is leading for the uh, leading the iris to prolapse out so it has prolapsed out so what i should not have done here is always remember whenever you are tucking the iris in our main aim is not to give any iris damage so what you have to do is you should gently push the iris inside with the instrument so that is the thing another thing always always remember not to over inflate the chamber with the ac just put the adequate visco right over the iris so that we can de deepen the anterior chamber so because it was a short tunnel you can see again it came out so i have told you the reasons another thing what you can do is what wrong i'm here doing is so i'm sweeping the iris it should have been done from the wound site and gently and the the solution to this problem is always abandon the first incision and make a new one and now you can see without any hassle i'm able to complete the case doing the rexes did the visco and continued my phaco emulsification without any hassle coming to the next video so this is another case where i had made a short tunnel and you can see while i'm doing hydro dissection and the iris has prolapsed so the reason here for the iris to prolapse is there are two reasons first is a short tunnel the other thing is while when i'm doing hydro dissection what has happened is there is a uh, there's a lifting of the nucleus and secondly the fluid is coming out the rapid outflow of the fluid which causes the iris to prolapse out so what i should have done here is i should have gone from the side port paracentesis with the spatula tapped the nucleus taken out the fluid decrease the pressure of the anterior chamber so another mistake what i did here is some uh, 
I should have been gentle with the IRS. So if you see here, so I was not gentle and there, there are IRS defects. So always remember the exogenous causes like you can loosen the speculum. And in this case also, I just abandoned my first wound and I started, made a new incision, did the hydrodissection. So always remember Iris has got memory, make a new incision and you can comfortably complete the case. So uh, another thing is when the wound is too large, if you see here in the uh, side port, the side port instrument is smaller than the wound size. So you can see the iris prolapse here due to, again, first reason is there is a rapid outflow of the fluid from the uh, side port incision, second high AC pressure leading to iris prolapse. So the another step where you have to uh, be careful is I'm just showing you a video where while irrigating or entering or exiting the main incision, there's a iris prolapse. You can see the main wound and there's an iris prolapse. So why did the iris prolapse occur? So first, high AC pressure, rapid outflow, and it came out. So even, uh, there's another video where I'm gonna show you, uh, while even doing stromal hydration, how you have to be gentle and not vigorous. So I was doing a vigorous stromal hydration. What has happened is increased AC pressure, and then you can see here. So what I did here is, if you see, so my uh, action was, plan of action was to decrease the AC pressure. So from the side port, I depressed the paracentesis so that the fluid should be out. AC pressure should be less. Another thing, what I did here was no touch technique. So no touch technique is just gentle tapping of the main wound incision. And it just goes in. This is another video. So you can see here, irrigation should always be off while you are exiting the wound. Here it was on. So that thing which we have to keep in mind. Never over inflate the AC with OVD. You can see how the iris is prolapsing out. Why did it prolapse out? Because of the high AC pressure and rapid outflow. So here you can see how I'm bringing the spatula from this paracentesis to the wound site. So you should gently sweep the iris from the wound site, making sure you're not causing any trauma to the iris. Here, why the iris is not going back in is because of two reasons. First, there's a high AC pressure, and second, rapid outflow of the visco. So I'm just depressing the wound, taking out the visco, decreasing the AC pressure, tapping on the main wound so that it goes back. Gentle tapping, avoiding any touch to the iris and decreasing the AC pressure by taking, you can see I'm depressing the side port incision also, taking out the visco from there. So all these things, four things, AC, high AC pressure, wound gaping, rapid outflow. So now I have injected adrenaline for the dilatation. So always remember whenever you are entering the main mode, irrigation off and then on. Even while taking out, irrigation should be off. Never over inflate the AC with OVD. Irrigation off, then on. So these are the few things which we have to keep in mind. This is another case with a short tunnel. Yeah. So iris prolapse is a tetrad of floppy iris, wound gape, rapid outflow, and high AC pressure. No touch repositioning avoids iris damage. Our aim is to avoid high pressure in the interior chamber. Always remember iris has got memory. Respect tissues, tissues will respect you. Thank you.
Yeah, while Dr. Rohit is setting up, uh, just a few things, wonderful uh, videos uh, to share. Uh, actually, Iris prolapse, uh, I think one thing we must remember is the first step, the first step which you naturally have to do, uh, get to is pushing the iris back. And that's precisely what we need to avoid. The iris is already, already prolapsing, but the knuckle has visco or fluid trapped under it. Pushing it is not going to help. The very reason it came out is because of that fluid. So what do you do now? Side port. Side port first. Side port first, decompress the anterior chamber without allowing the iris to prolapse. Because you now have a handle on it. Use a side port instrument, gently, 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 whatever you want, without allowing the iris to prolapse. Now once the AC is controlled, now you start doing whatever depending upon the extent of iris prolapse. If it's a small iris prolapse, no, no touch will do. Just sweeping the anterior lip of the cornea is fine. If it's a larger one, you just push a little bit because yours, you need, and the most of your work should be from the side port. Now you, once you've got most, the pupil margin into the anterior chamber, depends upon how much of your iris prolapse. You've got the pupil margin out, it's not going to go back by your pushing, a low, I mean, your no touch. So if you, the, now you push, once you've got the pupil margin in, use the side port instrument to drag the pupil margin now into the anterior chamber. Now there's no fluid inside the knuckle. Now you can get back fairly atraumatically. I think that should be your plan of action. Uh, may not work ideally, but this is what it should be. So decompress the anterior chamber first. Yeah. Absolutely. So misdirection syndrome. Now usually we have, uh, we have already talked about different causes of iris prolapsing. So I would be talking about an endogenous cause in the form of fluid misdirection syndrome. So how does it typically present with? Well, you will find what is happening is that the surgery is going on in a very uneventful way. And you would find that more or less, not always, these are the hyperopes who are more prone. But you will find that at times there is some bit of rexis, rexis extension. But there are quite a few situations where the rexis is intact. What happens? most probably in these cases is that there's a lax zonular fibers which allows the entry of the BSS through into the posterior segment. And when does it happen? It doesn't happen at the very outset. It happens near the end of the surgery when you suddenly find that the AC pressure has started rising. The interior chamber ha has started shallowing and the iris has started to prolapse. So now this situation, what is the patho pathophysiology? The pathophysiology is that BSS percolates into posterior segment. There is accumulation of fluid in posterior segment. There is an increase in posterior pressure. Forward displacement and raised interior chamber pressure are the sequelae which are involved in it. So what needs to be done at this stage? You need to stop. You need to look. You need to listen. Listen what? listen what the, whether the patient is in pain or not, and then you have to act. And what are the external causes which immediately should be looked into? Like lid speculum, as has already been shown, drapes at times. At times it's so happening, if you have given a retrobulbar block, there's a slowly progressing, slowly evolving retrobulbar hemorrhage. And there, are, there was once when I saw that the patient was okay, and, and when I took off the drape, I realized that the patient has saw, had some bit of, uh, you know, retrobulbar hemorrhage, which was causing the, uh, you know, the increase in pressure. And the endogenous causes in the form of fluid misdirection syndrome. Well, if there's a suprachoroidal leak, you don't have to do all these things. You have to observe and act as fast as possible. Now, the question is, what is the management? As the most important thing is, if you have opened it up, then you have to close all incisions, observe, examine the posterior pole. Well, most of us here would not be into that state of mind where we have, because we all primarily are interior segment surgeons, we don't have a posterior segment help at that point of time. So you cannot do that. But all that you have to see is whether the pressure is has risen suddenly or is there any red glow, which is red, uh, you know, uh, coming up or a dark shadow which is coming up and then you have to decide 
whether you have to use mannitol do pass plana minimal vitrectomy definitely after excluding supracoroidal hemorrhage so we should know what are the differentiating signs of fluid misdirection syndrome and supracoroidal leak or hemorrhage if it is a fluid misdirection syndrome it has a slow progression it is typically painless there are some ocular risk factors which may be there or which may not be there because there may be occult zonulopathy also or there may be some laxity in the zonules which may be causing or there and if it happens to be a supracoroidal one it is usually fast onset and progressive systemic risk factors are usually there hypertensive patient old patient prolonged surgery painful at times the patient says that he's having pain and appearance of a dark shadow let's see this video this is a very old video uh, which i could find uh, here you will see what is happening is can you switch off these lights so that it becomes more visible you will what you will find is that the phacoemulsification has progressed normally suddenly what has happened is that while i am doing the uh, irrigation aspiration i find that the posterior capsule has ceased to be concave it has become flat and it has become it is becoming progressively convex so the you will see now what is happening is the moment i take it out there is you can see the burp of you know the visco you will again find the burp of visco so this shows that there is something which is happening either it is i'll see the speculum i'll try to release it and try to you see the pressure the pressure is on the higher side so what i did at that is a very old video i just put an iol to see what has and you can see now still that the pressure that the iris has started coming out i'm again trying to release that the speculum and then trying to you know reposition the iol but the iris is coming out the pressure is on the higher side i did not have you know the posterior segment help at that point of time as most of us don't have so i'll just try to press it so that i can release some bit of ovd from the side port trying to do which is not possible the patient was slightly uncooperative that made me feel it the patient might be having some supracoroidals because it was turning out to be painful but since i was so i'm just trying to you know depress it i could not take through the side port because the chamber was totally shallow at that point of time now tapping the roof i thought at this point of time that i'll just leave it here put some air if i can making an effort to put air which is quite an effort at this point of time so what i am going to do now is i am going to see if somehow i can do it i'll just remove it i'll have a posterior segment view there's an osher lens which is available which can be put on the you know and then you can see the posterior segment i have not used it but then uh, you know you can uh, the air is there now what is the next thing which is going to happen is that i am going to close it get the posterior segment examined you'll see and come back after some time and once the posterior segment has been anomaly has been removed now you will find after and using mannitol has been used now the pressure is practically normal and the surgery could be completed without any hassle the iol was placed back and the surgery was completed this is another video courtesy dr bhatacharya so now what is happening is the pressure at this point of time has started increasing there will be some difficulty in placing the iol in the bag at this point of time because the pressure has started rising the posterior capsule is no longer concave it has become flat or it has become convex so this is something which is the pressure is not it is not soft 
it is on the ha- harder side trying to just push the iol into the bag so that once it is there then you can see now the iris is trying to come out the i there's difficulty in iol being placed in the bag so next step is at this point of time since here also there was no immediate facility to examine the posterior segment to rule out the supracoroidal hemorrhage or effusion recovery room 100 cc manitol indirect ophthalmoscopy once that has been ruled out now you can go to the through the pars plana dr suvain you showed it in ascrs if you remember a similar <laughs> yeah yeah so i got a lot to talk about has been done the the eye will become soft and the procedure can be easily completed so you, you now you will see that without any problem things have been done so questions now dr me have let's see when if you remember yeah yeah, yeah i remember losing losing a battle uh, but I, winning a war that uh, was yes yes that was a topic and uh, coming from there can i see a show of hands how many of you have had an expulsive hemorrhage good oh. so if you've not had you've not done enough surgery <laughs> yeah. uh, i've had my share of expulsive hemorrhages i have saved eyes i have lost eyes i have saved others eyes i have lost my own eyes so uh, i've had fluid misdirection i've had the whole spectrum probably i take up more ganda cases than others uh, it's become more risk averse these is with all that that's happening doctor bashing so now i'm having less of it but still th- once in a while so uh, i would look at it this way like dr rohit said that yes i have had this i've learned from hindsight wisdom hindsight wisdom is i think pretty relevant over here all of us our main focus is to put in that lens any which way otherwise we just can't go back home my wife will not let me get in that's kind of that's the kind of mentality we have you know if i don't put that lens i've lost a battle and i just can't go back home mood dikhane lag nahi raha get that out of get that out of your mind i have lost even 6 months back i've lost her eye because the same ego and adamant attitude and still i don't learn we don't learn we don't learn it was a bad case so same as dr rohit showed as uh, as actually i was using iris hooks in that case it was a bad case so that was one case which i used for a long long time but AC became flat fluid i thought it was fluid misdirection i wanted to finish it put in the lens and pat my pc went then i realized the choroid was in the midvitreous so now i was dealing with an expulsive and this was a total mess and i did salvage the lens was inside i removed the single piece lens i the clean adamant that you are put in a multi piece lens uh vitrectomy you do vitrectomy the expulsive is increasing uh, so you were, i mean it's a comedy of errors so i would say one simple take home message any which way just close that i and forget about it for the next 2 hours only 2 hours of patience you need and you have to underplay underplay patients attendant no no kuch bolne ki zarurat hi nahi hai kuch you we have had to abort midway we will reassess after 2 hours and we'll take a yeah. call because if you have the confidence because if you have screwed up there's no going back yeah. if you talk in the nice way to the patients attendants making it appear that in a few percentage the best thing for the eye is that you be put the lens afterwards see one thing i've learned in life is the if you want to get a message across just tell the other party what his interest is simple what's your benefit if i had continued with the case i would have lost the eye so in your interest i have postponed it i'll take a call after 2 hours khatam ho gayi baat theek hai that's that's the same thing dealing with every patient in the last 30 years of practice i've just realized tell him what is his benefit in every call that we take it's not my money it's not my time my list nothing it's your eye i have taken the call in your interest if i had gone on with my ego i would have finished i would have lost the eye so i have taken I'll, i'm taking 2 hours from you i'll take a call i'm not saying i'll do it after 2 hours 
If I think the condition is favorable, I'll go ahead today or I'll postpone it for one week. And I did that in that case that I showed in the ESCRS. I lost that battle. The family, the family was good. I told them, I, 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 I don't have a B scan on the table now. So I'll get a B scan done tomorrow. You do the B scan. In fact, the B scan was not in my facility. So get the B scan done elsewhere. Got a B scan done. And the beauty is next day you'll find, find nothing on the B scan. If you do the B scan right then, you will probably see a supracoroidal or a effusion or something. But two hours, three hours later, you'll see nothing. It's all gone. So that's how uh, I think it's best is to defer, defer, and defer. Where whatever stage you are, and postpone that IL, IL implantation. If the piece is intact, you can do it any day. You can do it any day. You can revisit that surgery. Do it free of cost. Don't charge anything. It's a, it's a difficult thing for patient. And I mean, if you want to comfort the patient, the next day you just put a plus 10D and show him, I just need to put this lens inside. The cataract is out. So that, that should be the take home message.